Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for attending. My name is Sean Kogan. I'm the new business development manager at Harkin. Um, I'm a Sprat Level 2 lead technician and an IRATA Level 1 uh, certified rope access worker. Um, today we're going to talk about the Harkin Power Seat and um, some general configurations, some applications of use in um, different um, either industrial environments or different job scenarios. So let's uh, let's get started. And again, thanks for thanks for tuning in. So just a quick introduction to the Harkin Power Seat. Um, it's a revolutionary device for working at height. Um, the unique Harkin Power Seat is revolutionizing working at height, providing the worker with the ability to ascend quickly, stay in position longer, and work in comfort. The Power Seat provides quality, convenience, safety, and the best solution for completing a task on time. Um, I'm going to be going through the general mechanics of the power seat here with you. Um, I may be projecting one of my own learning styles here, so I apologize, but I really like to have a full understanding of the mechanics um, and operations of the devices that I'm using while working at height um, before trusting my life to them. So general introduction of machine components. In this, in this picture, you can uh, it's a um, nice height for the power seats to have a dueling power seat battle there. But um, the left side of the machine is the engine component, and the right side being the winch component uh, with a gearbox in between. Um, so I'm going to start with the engine component, because I do get a lot of questions about the engine. I, I think it's a common misconception that this is your typical weed eater engine, um, and it's anything but that. Um, the engine is a Honda GX35. It's a 35cc uh, four-stroke engine. Um, and Harkin chose this engine, you know, mainly because Honda's reliability is world-renowned. And um, in a <clears throat> in a power-driven winch situation where there's no manual override, um, you, you know, the the actual function of the winch is only as good as the power head that is driving it. Um, now, I'm not going to read through every bullet point of the Honda GX35 engine because this can all be found at hondaengines.com. Um, there are a couple key features that I would like to point out, though. Um, one, um, it is a four-stroke engine. It's the smallest four-stroke engine available on the market, um, and which was a big component in our um, choice there because it does fit certain size parameters that we were looking for um, and the power output that we were looking for. Um, the main feature, though, that I think is just so spectacular about this engine is that it's a full 360 any side up operation, um, meaning that it's a completely omnipositional engine, so you can turn this thing upside down, backwards, um, any way you want, and um, it's still going to run. Uh, without a hiccup because it's not it's not a typical injector situation. It's a diaphragmed carburetor, um, and any overflow goes right back into the tank. Um, so there's very very little risk of any type of uh, fuel leak, um, or and obviously working around synthetic fiber materials. That's uh, that's highly important. And again, all of this information and uh, a little bit more about this engine can be found at HondaEngines.com if you're interested in checking it out. Uh, on to the winch component of the power seat. Um, just a quick overview of Harkin's experience with winches. Um, Harkin has a long history of being regarded as the highest quality manufacturer, manufacturer of winches used in sailing applications. Um, with decades of experience in designing winches for the harshest of marine environments, um, Harkin introduced the power seat as a rope access tool and a natural progression of bringing reliable rope handling technology uh, to the industrial marketplace and, and working at height um, applications as well as rigging applications. But just this is kind of a lineup of some of our capstan winches. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you can see the range that there's um, 
manual driven ones, electric driven ones, hydraulic driven ones, just about any configuration that you can come up with um, for a sailing need, we've, we've designed uh, to those specs and now have branched out um, after, you know, um, a couple of decades of trial and error and really getting this design to where it's uh, regarded as some of the best capstone winches made. The power seat winch, however, might look a little bit different to you um, because there is a captive head system. Uh, the power seat winch is derived from, the Harken, from Harkin's popular radial series winches. The power seat winch is um, designed with a captive head cover to ensure the rope remains in the self-tailing jaw. Um, this creates a fail-safe braking mechanism and a constant progress capture of the rope. And just a quick side-by-side -side comparison, um, the power seat winch on the left, the radial 40 um, self-tailing winch on the right. Um, these are a comparable size winch to one another. Um, and just the main differences in the self-tailing mechanisms. Um, again, the power seat does, the power seat winch does have a captive head system, and I'll get into that a little bit in a second. Um, but the radial 40 on the right um, has also has a self-tailing mechanism, but in sailing and in some other applications, it's it's imperative to be able to release the rope from the self-tailing jaws um, quickly. So uh, that's that's why in, in, on the picture on the right, you can see the self-tailing jaws is open all the way around, and on the picture of the left, um, that captive head will actually hold the rope in those self-tailing jaws until it is an, a very intentional release. The key features of the power seat, um, and again, I will get to some pictures where you can see this in use, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to go over the mechanics first. Um, the ergonomic design is, um, I'll actually get to that in a couple of slides, but uh, I think the benefits of sitting on an actual molded seat versus hanging in a harness um, are, are kind of self-explanatory. Um, the speed control is, it is a variable speed. Um, so with a max speed, uh, ascent speed of 15 meters a minute or just under 50 feet per minute. Um, but it, it, it will do that with a 300 pound load um, without any problem. And <clears throat> excuse me again, sorry. The, um, the braking mechanism is a fail safe brake. So if you, if you were to, um, you know, slip or let go of ropes or whatever the case may be, you're, you rest assured that that rope is not going to be released from that self-tailing mechanism on the winch. Um, durability, um, Harkin has and always will use the highest quality materials available um, that will work within the parameters of design that we're looking for. Um, and the CE certification, um, this is a certified machine to the machinery directive and independently verified by the Bureau of Veritas. Um, for any certification information, I would like to uh, refer you to the declaration of conformity found on the power seat, found in the power seat manual, rather. Um, it's available for download at uh, www.power-seat.com. Um, okay, so. Um, getting on to rigging the power seat, I and mean, you know, a lot of times people just say, okay, well, cool, that looks great, but how does it work? Um, so I'm going to go step by step here. I didn't want to use video um, risking connection speeds and having choppy video. So um, all of this, again, can be found in our manual. Um, and I'm going to use the picture on the left as a constant reference in this next section so that you know you can kind of orient or, you know, the orientation of the um, components that we're looking at in relationship to the machine as a whole. Um, so the first step is you notice that there's an upright stem or tube. Um, that, uh, that actually locks into place with an auto-locking clamp mechanism. Um, so you would open the clamp and slide the tube into the housing. And I would like to point out at this point um, you might notice that the 
sling is girthed onto uh, what we refer to as the rigging plate or frontal plate of the machine. Um, and this would be your primary personal attachment point. Um, you know, in this picture, we are not making any type of recommendations as far as what uh, sling or, pers or primary personal attachment point you use. Um, in this image, it is a, um, it is a Dyneema sling. Um, but again, that's personal preference. Some people like to be in much closer than that or using a dynamic lanyard. Um, and this, this is not at all um, an, an instruction by way of using that in the picture. Um, all right, so when installed correctly, the, there's a red safety reference in that upright tube. Um, and it'll be visible from the rigging plate side of the power seat. So uh, when that tube locks in place, the red should disappear, um, and the spring mechanism auto-locking clamp will then return to a flush position so that it cannot get snagged on any rope or sling. Um, this will be an audible connection. You will hear it click into place um, and, and then verify that it's connected properly by way of the red safety reference uh, no longer being visible. Um, okay, so rigging from the top side, um, slipping the rope past the pin at the top of the vertical tube and aligning the rope into the tube is just a way of keeping everything organized um, and you know out of contact of the operator's harness and just keeping everything very clean and organized and this tube actually ends up um, being a guide system guiding the rope down to the winch itself. So align the rope, in, and I'm, I apologize for this picture on the top right. Um, there is a fair lead um, shiv that you might or might not be able to see depending on how the resolution on your screen. Um, but align the rope into the shiv of the entry fair lead pulley, which um, basically just positions the rope and gives it a smooth um, surface to guide the rope into the, uh, the winch mechanism. Again, looking at, and I'm going to point at it with my arrow, but right here on this frontal plate is this opening, which you can confirm the rope is around the fair lead pulley when it's rigged correctly. The rope will rest between the shiv and on the on the fair lead, um, and there's also a um, a positioning guide arm which uh, keeps the rope in contact with that fair lead. Okay, so um, as the rope comes past the fair lead and engages with the winch, um, all of the capstan winches are um, everything is clockwise. Um, it always gets wound clockwise. If it does not, um, it will not operate correctly. Um, and that is not to say that it will operate in a way that would bring you up to a point and then release anything. It will just simply um, reject the rope if it's wound incorrectly. So um, <clears throat> wrapping the drum, uh, we recommend that there's a minimum of two wraps required. Um, and you know. The entire purchase of this system um, is friction based, so the whole rope advanced system is based on friction with that drum. So um, it does become a personal preference. Um, I like to use three wraps as my general benchmark, and if I need more friction, simply add a wrap or simply uh, take a wrap out if I would like to have less friction. Um, now the on the last wrap of the drum, the rope comes over this piece here that we call the stripper arm, and that basically sets it up to enter the self-tailing jaw in a, um, in a more properly aligned manner. So again, with this captive head, it's a spring-loaded head, um, which actually needs to be opened to, um, to reeve the rope into it. And excuse me. Um, so the captive head cover is spring loaded, and once the rope is seated into the self-tailing jaw in the proper manner, um, that self 
that uh, spring-loaded head will close smoothly and will uh, completely um, surround the rope in that self-tailing jaw. And so your last final wrap of the rope coming here over the stripper arm and around the self-tailing jaw, if everything is rigged correctly, then everything should line up properly. Um, and the rope will end up, the tail end of the rope will come out of um, the captive head between this guide and the stripper arm. Um, the powered rope advance, and this could refer to either ascending a rope or uh, using this as a winch, hauling a rope, um, simply set the accelerator switch to on to the on position. Uh, gently pull the starter cord and use the two-part accelerator trigger for variable speed rope advance, whether ascending or extending the rope or hauling with it. Um, I did throw the adjective gently pull the starter cord in there because um, this engine has been designed to relieve some of the pressure of um, the cylinder pressure and displacement in those cylinders, so you're not actually having to overcome um, the pressure in the cylinders to start the engine the way you would with um, some older model lawn mowers and, and alike. Um, it is a two-part accelerator trigger. Um, we call it a dead man switch, which means that you have to be in contact with two points of the trigger at all times for it to operate. Um, very similar to what you would find on a chainsaw for a safety mechanism. Um, there will be one part of the trigger that is in contact with the palm of your hand, and then the secondary part of the trigger will be engaged with um, index finger or middle finger. So that was going up. Now we'll talk about going down or releasing rope through the mechanism. Um, I would like to point out that there, when it comes to a descent or a rope release, this is a very intentional function. It has to be done manually. Um, and that was designed in uh, purposefully so that you could never, um, you know, simply be hitting, um, simply be driving the wrong way by mistake and all of a sudden you're um, coming to the end of your line. So <clears throat> everything with the rope release mechanism and the descent is has to be an intentional movement and it is a manual um, mechanism. So like with any uh, descent device, um, the brake hand of the operator, while the, um, while the lowering mechanism is engaged, the operator's brake hand should remain in control of the tail end of the rope. And I think that uh, goes across the board for descent devices. Um, the operator will then use the, the right hand to reach down and open that, um, that captive head cover on the self-tailing jaw, which basically releases a little bit of pressure between the, um, the tooth mechanism of that jaw, allowing the rope to uh, a controlled friction descent on the drum from that point on. Um, and just in direct comparison, there's um, you know, with typical descent devices, you are usually, um, there's usually about six inches of rope. Um, in some, there's a little bit more. Um, in contact with what would be, with what would create the friction for descent. Um, and so when you see these, um, these wraps on the drum, you know, the drum is, a, is a three and it's three inches and one eighth in diameter. Um, which I'm no mathematician, but um, I believe that's somewhere in the ballpark of about 14 inches of circumference. So there's, with each wrap of the drum, there is 14 inches of rope contact uh, with the hard coat anodized aluminum um, drum. So your, your friction control is very, very um, sensitive and the, the um, descent mechanism is very controlled. So back to the ergonomic design, um, and now we get to see some pictures of people actually playing. Um, 
The design of the molded seat supports the operator in upright position rather than in a hanging position or suspended position. And I, I put the word hanging in, in quotation marks because as many of you know, um, you know after, after a six, eight hour, eight hour day in a harness, you may as well be hanging. Um, the design significantly decreases fatigue. It disperses the supported body pressure away from the operator's kidney regions. Um, and the femoral artery of the inner thigh, allowing better circulation and comfort for prolonged stints of work. Um, both the kidneys and the femoral artery have always been kind of a, um, a, a danger point for um, um, harness-induced pathology if you're in a harness for a prolonged period of time. And, um, and the, the seat also kind of gives you that um, hands-free movement, um, complete lock-off, and uh, just to give you an idea, this is um, this is a picture of a tuft installation on a wind turbine blade where um, my friend Charlie here is literally having to install hundreds of little eight-inch um, synthetic fiber yarns. So if you can imagine managing hundreds of little yarns and pieces of tape and uh, little tubes of sealer, um, it's, it's nice to have a actual comfortable seated position to do a job like that. You can use it in a suspended position, um, and some people just like to do this. Uh, they like being in their harness rather than on a seat, um, and you know, no problems there. The um, operating in a suspended position, though, is has a unique function because um, you know, I say it's used mainly to accomplish long ascents with the intent of easily escaping the device for a maneuver at the anchor deviation. Um, and the rope does remain in a ten tensionless wrap configuration. So um, the working line coming down to the winch uh, will, there are no pinch points when it goes through the winch and, and through the self-tailing mechanism. Um, so you can engage the work line with your typical positioning gear um, underneath the power seat without doing any, um, without putting any additional um, tension on either the uh, power seat or the rope and there's no loss of strength because there's, again, because there's no pinch point, there's no knots, it's just um, um, the bend radius going around that drum. Um, makes for a very comfortable rope position. So the rugged design, um, here again in the susp suspended position, um, you can see how the frame, the tubular steel frame of the power seat is holding all of the, um, the main business end of it away from um, the structure itself. So you're not damaging your rigging plate um, or any of the mechanical components of the machine when you're using it in this configuration. Um, if you were to be sitting on the machine going up a structure, then you would be using your feet and hands to keep yourself off of the structure. So again, you wouldn't be in contact with any of the mechanical components at that time. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of the applications that we've had some good successes with uh, so far with the power seat where it's truly just been a game changer. Um, with bridges and infrastructure, I mean, these bridges are just so big. Um, and to think about doing uh, fracture critical inspections on bridges all by means of manual um, access and ascent is uh, the time that would be needed is just, um, it, it's too much to allow. So in inspection and maintenance, um, we've, we've been able to implement um, shorter time frames and, and much less fatigue on jobs like this. Um, as far as rigging plans go, we've had it into rigging plans for tensioning high lines, for transporting materials, um, and also in the rescue plan for recovery. Um, some of these bridges are over water, um, and the option of lowering an injured worker um, is, well, it's just plain not an option. So you'd have to come up with a system to 
bring them back to the road deck, and that's, that's where the power seat has come in on the planning side of it. So this next slide is a testimonial from the engineers that you just saw on that bridge. Um, <clears throat> again, there, well, not again, but there might be a couple grammatic, uh, grammatical mistakes here. So just forgive me, I'm not going to change anyone's um, quote. The, the Harkin power seat was, instrumental tool, was an instrumental tool for the recent fracture critical member bridge inspection of the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge this past June by Transystems Corporation. Inspection of the signature cable stage structure in Dallas, Texas required numerous vertical as ascents to a height of over 400 feet. Particularly in the summer heat of North Texas, it was critical to ensure that our staff avoided fatigue and the power seat was the ideal solution to realize this goal. Utilizing this tool allowed the team to operate effortlessly and efficiently while also helping to complete work quickly so the team members were not subject to excessive sun exposure. Operating the power seat was very intuitive, and ascents even to significant height were smooth and comfortable for our Sprat certified bridge inspectors. The engine was very easy to start initially. Excuse me, there was a page in the background. Um, okay. The engine was very easy to start initially and can be turned off and back on while on ropes in order to save gas and reduce noise during prolonged work at a single location. Um, our work typically includes two inspectors working in tandem on power seats, and the minimal noise generated by the engine helped the workers to maintain communication even while applying the throttle. Um, positioning and stability were made very painless by the front stem of the power seat and the various tie-off points of the stem eye bolt and lower frame helped inspectors keep their clipboards and rope bags nearby without getting in the way. Just to gain a bit of perspective, um, the picture that I just showed from underneath is this bridge in, on the bottom of the page. Um, so you can see, you know, obviously it's a difficult access situation um, and the option of inspecting it by moonlight, as seen there, was, was not an option. So, um, And this is a continuance of the testimonial by these engineers, which, by the way, I'd like to point out are all uh, PMI VRS trained rope access engineers. Um, the versatility of the power seat will further increase the usefulness of having the units on site. The ability to sit on the power seat or hang from beneath it uh, makes it a more diverse tool based on the work situation. In addition, these options will help inspectors to feel more comfortable um, based on their personal preferences during work. The power seat can also be used as a winch, uh, allowing our team to use it to hoist equipment to the top of large pylons or towers when needed. Uh, inspectors can readily exit or climb into the power seat while it is in operation, increasing the level of safety of our team in the event of an emergency situation. All of these functions, with all of these functions, the power seat will continue to serve as an integral tool in our safety plans for future bridge inspection jobs. So I'm going to stay on the topic of bridge inspections for just another minute here and um, go to another um, very great company to work with. Um, Stantec Engineering was doing the fracture critical inspection of the Hoover Dam Bypass Bridge or the uh, Pat Tillman, Michael Callahan uh, Memorial Bridge at the, at the border of um, Nevada and Arizona over the Colorado River. You can see in the background um, one of the engineers on ascent coming up one of the pylons, uh, the, one of the tallest pylons um, on the Arizona abutment side of the bridge. He looks pretty comfortable, doesn't he? Stantec wants to thank Harkin for the power seat used during the O'Callaghan-Tillman Memorial Bridge inspection this past January. The numerous long ascents of approximately 300 feet plus uh, were made significantly easier with the use of the power seat. This enabled our staff to stay fresh, more alert, and ultimately safer. The increased efficiency during long ascents lessens fatigue and may allow operators to function with smaller staff, increasing cost savings to their customers. 
During ascents, the power seat provided a very smooth pace of movement and the ability to stop and inspect or otherwise perform duties without turning the device completely off. Additionally, the power seat was a, was a vital piece of our rescue plan in the, event, in the event raising an injured climber to the deck became necessary as lowering was not an option on this site. Uh, this function was tested and verified prior to inspection in a warehouse setting, um, actually at the VR, uh, PMI VRS Training Center in Denver. Um, more industrial applications that we've, uh, we've had experience and success with um, is, you know, I think everyone would expect that the power seat would do very well in uh, the wind um, turbine maintenance fields. And I, I know, and actually this is um, the rope access technician on the left is, is me, so I, I know firsthand that, um, you know, the, I think it takes everyone by surprise the first time you uh, lower off of the nose cone or nacelle of a um, wind turbine and of just how big some of these blades are. And depending what the job is you're doing um, that particular day, you may you may be doing multiple, um, you know, ascents and descents uh, just to do the most mundane of ta mundane of tasks. But um, you just have to cover ground. And the power seat definitely helps in that regard. So again, with wind, the turbine inspection, blade repair, and general maintenance at height. Um, and really, I just like looking at pictures of wind turbines. So sorry for that. Um, the power seat has been implemented in rescue and recovery as well. Um, and actually, in these in these two split pictures here, this was a uh, a test of the power seat and actually a testament to the um, the performance of the Honda uh, GX35. Um, these were uh, high altitude tests being performed in the Alps um, to um, just to make sure that we can maintain engine compression um, in thin air environments for uh, rescue situations. And so this also introduces the configuration of having it being a fixed point winch um, for hauling or hoisting. You can see it. You can see on the bottom slide how the power seat is anchored by the lower portion of the rigging plate and the line continuing to the uh, the tripod. For more rescue and recovery, the um, the power seat's rated for a two-person rescue load. Uh, it's 273 kilograms is its safe working load, or that's just over 600 pounds, I think 601. Um, it can be used for hauling a rescue litter and um, a rescue attendant with that litter uh, without the need of additional mechanical advantage, saving rope, um, effort, and most importantly, time. Um, a rescuer can make a direct connection to the patient while controlling ascent and descent functions um, at their own pace. Um, and also, um, you know, tailoring to the needs of the patient or casualty at the time. Um, as far as the caps and winches by Harkin go, there, there, there's no, um, we're not strangers to the rescue uh, type use scenario. Uh, multiple tripod manufacturers have made Harkin winch specific mounting plates to adapt directly to their systems. Um, so obviously they're seeing the benefits of the capstan winch. Um, using capstan winches for hauling allow for a direct uh, line hauling system of unlimited rope length where the mechanical advantage is achieved through gearing um, rather than um, adding additional pulleys um, and redirecting the rope back and forth through those pulleys to achieve the same mechanical advantage. Which again is nice. I mean, that saves time. There's no um, there's no system reset. You can you can easily let tension out and then crank it back in. This particular winch is a the, the winch we're looking at here is a two speed winch, um, and it can be operated manually or with uh, by using a drill. So. More with some fixed point hauling, hoisting, lifting, or dragging. Um, 
it's a very useful tool for material handling on um, in remote sites. It's a very powerful winch in um, <clears throat> you know in these places where a power source is otherwise um, you know not an option. Um, and so on, on top, these guys are in Austria building a Via Ferrata and had to move um, many, many timbers into position for walkways and for platforms. And um, obviously you can see the, the grade of the slope there is quite steep. So doing any of that from a manual perspective was just going to be uh, too laborious and too uh, time consuming. Um, the picture on the left. Um, one of the PMI employees might be recognizing their arm at this time. Um, but this is uh, just simply run through a redirect. We are uh, lifting rescue dummy, a rescue dummy into position to do some other um, rescue exercises off of that tower. So for alpine projects, alpine installations, slope stabilization, geotechnical work, uh, rock scaling. I mean, you can see here um, that the operator has two full haul bags uh, full of gear with him. He's and um, you know going. Actually, he is in descent mode at this point. Um, but the you know to be able to bring that much gear with you and not break a sweat is is quite an advantage. So we've, we've come across some pretty specialized applications with the power seat as well. Um, and, you know, hopefully we're just going to keep on being surprised by uh, the applications that people um, put the power seat into. The Harkin power seat was put to the test this past NFL season being used to get stadium personnel and Super Bowl advertising into position for the big game at MetLife Stadium, um, proving its versatility in difficult access situations. Um, which the it's it's it was a really nice um, tool for this job because not only were the um, the stadium personnel able to lift um, people into position around uh, what would otherwise be a very very difficult access position even for um, typical rope access techniques, uh, but then they were also able to turn around and bring. Um, components of the signs up to them, um, you know, relieving the weight of the signs on, on personnel and, um, and overall just making it safer for the personnel when they were in position because they weren't taking the weight of the sign the, the power seat was. Um, and, with, you know, the power seat was complemented nicely. Um, at the stadium because in this particular stadium, Harkin pulleys are used to rig the, um, the field goal nets in position um, to raise and lower those field goal nets. So it was nice to connect the dots in that stadium with Harkin. Um, I only have one slide left and I would like to preface it by saying that um, at Harkin we are um, we're very grateful for uh, having partnered with PMI in distribution of this product. Um, and a big a key component and a big part of leadership in that was um, with Steve Hudson. And so in showing this slide, I don't know if anyone at PMI has seen this yet. This was from Dealer Camp in October. Um, and we just want to give a special thanks to Steve and a remembrance to him. Um, this picture just brings a smile to my face when you when you see him because uh, he was just plain geeking out about that thing at that time. <laughs> um, so that that's that's the completion of my uh, slideshow today. And um, so thank you to PMI and uh, for putting these webinars on, and uh, we were happy to participate. Um, so Jess, I guess back over to you. Yeah. Thanks for that, Sean. And let me get the screen back over. All right. If you have any questions, um, go ahead and type them into the chat slash questions area of your control panel. And uh, we will ask them as we get them. And we actually already have quite a few questions. So um, oh we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, 
So the first question is, um, is any training required to buy a power seat? Uh, to purchase a power seat, no, and I guess it does depend on the applications um, of use of the power seat. We have, we have had seat, we have seen people purchase them using them only with the intention of having a mobile um, winch for remote locations. If the power seat is being used for industrial rope access, then um, those operators do need to be trained. Um, up to uh, SPRAT level one or IRATA level one standards. Um, and any, any work at height with the power seat on rope um, does need uh, specific training. Um, whether or not it's tool specific training, um, you know, regarding the power seat itself, um, both uh, there, there are some training programs um, that uh, VRS will be offering and um, so yes I would say that we would like to see um, competent users going through some sort of a at least orientation to the tool itself and um, if they're working at height or working on rope then they do need to be uh, working in, within the um, safe practices of that industry. Okay. Um, next question is, does the carburetor need to be readjusted at altitudes greater than 12,000 feet? You know, that's a good question. Um, I would refer you to Honda on that because we've only tested it at 11,000 feet, which was that picture in the Alps. Um, it is a diaphragmed carburetor. Um, you will, I'm sure that the air intake valve on that carburetor um, you know, you just like any uh, carbureted engine, um, yes, the air compression is going to make a difference. Um, and I would say that's going to be a trial and error. Um, but <clears throat> all anything that is engine specific um, can be found uh, in greater detail through going to HondaEngines.com. Uh, Okay, this one might also fall under that, but um, it's, does the power seat require high octane fuel and does it have a low oil shutoff? It does have a low oil shutoff, um, and as with any small engine, um, the higher the octane, the better the performance. Um, so yes, I always suggest that to go um, at least a 90 octane, and um, and the the engine itself it will, um, again, I mean, for more engine-specific questions, I would, I would refer to Honda, and all I can do is um, give general advice. Um, I, I don't want to misrepresent the, what Honda's recommendations are for their engine, but I know all that information is, is readily available. Okay. Um... Where can I buy a power seat or at least see one in action? Um, at uh, PMI, the VRS training facility. Um, there's uh, actually the, we, we will be uh, having a power seat at the NATE show next week, the National Association of Tower Rector Show in San Diego. Um, but as far as live demos or um, uh, training situations, um, I would refer to the VRS staff at PMI. All right. Um, what decibel level does the power seat have when operated at full throttle? Again, that's going to be, um, uh, let's see here. The There is a, it does meet certain uh, noise and vibration compliance, um, but Again, that's that's on the first page of the uh, HondaEngines.com site when you type in G, the GX35. Um, they list um, all of the uh, noise output and, vi and vibratory output as well. Okay. Um, can you talk about the rate of ascent and if there is any options for increasing the rate of ascent? Well, the, 
The rate of ascent is, as I mentioned before, it's 15 meters per minute or roughly 50 feet per minute. Um, and no, we, we intentionally kept it to um, that rate of speed uh, because it is a very comfortable rate of speed and you can do it with a heavy load. If by increasing the speed, um, it would be a different gear ratio. and We'd be increasing the speed and lowering the torque of, um, of the winch itself. And so um, we like to think of this as much more of a utilitarian type of machine where it's, it's your workhorse. Um, it's not meant to do, it's not meant to do it fast, it's meant to do it steady and strong. And sorry, for the second part of that question, as far as increasing the speed, um, as far as adding something into components or whatever, uh, there's, no, we, the, um, the winch is variable speed with the accelerator control. So anything up to um, that 15 meter per minute mark, um, you know, you can go as slow as you'd like or as fast as you'd like up to um, about 15 meters per minute. And I think once you get into the, um, the realm of ascending about a foot, I mean, it's just under a foot per second, um, that's, that's a very comfortable rate of speed and a safe rate of speed. Okay. Um, does this product have an overspeed brake? Well, in order to have an overspeed brake, um, I mean, as far as I understand anyway, um, an overspeed brake is referring to a centrifugal um, activated brake mechanism in, in case the winch would ever to freewheel out of control in the opposite direction. Um, that's actually the, um, it's actually impossible with these winches because our winches don't actually turn in a counterclockwise manner. Um, it's a ratcheting system and I'm not going to get too detailed into that for proprietary reasons, but um, it's a ratcheting system where um, the brake mechanism, it, basically you would have to um, the rope or the winch itself is only going to turn in one direction, which is clockwise, which only gives you rope advancement. Um, and in terms of an overspeed brake, the winch would have to freewheel counterclockwise in an out of control manner to engage a centrifugal uh, braking mechanism, um, which our uh, ratcheting mechanism is already does that. It locks the winch into whatever the last advancement position the winch was in is the final position the winch would be in. Um, if you were to let go of everything, um, it stays exactly in position. Um, and even further to that point, if you were to, um, I mean, you would have to literally intentionally um, unrig the entire system to have it to have it wouldn't be a freewheel situation it would be a situation of the rope uh, passing over the winch um, which would take numerous steps to do um, so it's not something that could happen unintentionally okay and uh, you kind of covered this a little bit in the presentation but what is the lifting capability so the safe or the um, <clears throat> the working load the safe working load is um, 273 kilograms or 601 pounds, um, and the you know at being a human suspension um, product, our our safety factors are are much greater than that. Um, so we like to say keep it keep it within 600 pounds as far as a safe uh, working load limit. Um, but braking strength, the, uh, the system itself is, is tested to a 10 to 1 safety factor um, before absolute failure. So there's, um, you know, if you're using it as a winch, um, you can do certain things with it. If you're using it for human suspension or uh, for uh, rope access scenarios, then I would I would advise not mixing the two. Um, the same the same way you would treat a rope. If you're gonna if you're gonna put a rope into a winch scenario where you're pulling a truck out of a ditch, I would say don't uh, then go suspend a human from that rope. 
Um, and same, same type of scenario with this piece of equipment. If you are using it primarily as a winch and you have knowingly exceeded the safe working load numerous times, um, then I would not transition back into using it for human suspension. Um, but it will it will move 600 pounds, um, you know, effortlessly with uh, the pull of the trigger. All right, and kind of on the same lines, what is the stall load? Well, actually, there there is no stall load um, because what happens with this winch which is a great feature. It's a wonderful safety feature, and if you were to ask one of the uh, lead instructors over there at PMI what happens when you intentionally uh, ram the power seat into um, an anchor point or into a piece of structure, um, not mentioning any names, but uh, we, we did test that. Um, and the engine does not stall out. What happens is there is uh, more of a friction override than anything, and so the, the winch will actually spin within the rope when it gets to a point um, where it's maxed out. It doesn't actually, um, you know, the winch doesn't actually stop and then stall out the, the engine. Okay. And um, has this product been tested or listed by UL or other, another nationally recognized testing laboratory? Um, again, for any of these certification questions, I would refer you to the um, the declaration of conformity because they're depending on which industry you're working in and which industry you're trying to use this in um, there's you know the the regulatory conversation about power to senders could go on for days um, and yes we have had it independently tested by Bureau Veritas which is also recognized in the United States uh, we have gone beyond that and had it um, run through a third-party testing lab um, specifically for North American uses. Um, so the, the CE mark um, to the machinery directive, if you look in the Declaration of Conformity, there's, um, there's a number of uh, points that it needs to meet. Um, and again, I mean, that's a... So short answer, yes. Uh, long answer, it could take, you know, any regulation or regulatory conversation could could take uh, you know could take a long time. Okay, this one might have the same answer, but um, okay. it's kind of an involved question, so uh, I'll give it to you in two parts. First of all, okay. um, it appears that the product would fall under CFR 1926.452 definitions as a Botswins chair. Is that correct, or is there another standard that applies? So, as far as um, it, right, I mean, as far as it being, I guess that that all the 1926 all um, refers to scaffolding and um, suspended platforms, and so it depends on how you read into it because it exceeds anything that's written in as a bosun's chair, um, and there's really no neat category that this fits into quite yet. Um, the regulatory control and the regulatory uh, um, systems there is, um, sorry, I just got a little distracted. The, um, so it does fit into what would be described as a bosun's chair. However, it wouldn't fit into the description of a bosun's chair uh, being a plank of wood with an X pattern of manila rope underneath. Um, obviously, it's far advanced from that standard. Um, it is a single point suspended work platform. Um, which always needs to be used in a um, in a secondary safety rope configuration. Um, so again, any any type of specific, um, you know, I, I imagine that's that question is coming from someone in the um, the general uh, building maintenance and or uh, window washing um, type of profession, and so. Industry by industry, there are different um, there are different regulations that apply, and so any of those questions, um, I know that you'll be able to email email me directly um, at the end of this webinar, and I'd be happy to um, work with you trying to uh, 
identify specific regulations within the specific tasks and uh, industries in which you're working. Okay, and the second part to that question is, are there any published exemptions or letters of interpretation to address some of the issues in 1926 subpart L? The, again, uh, yes, um, we've, we'd be happy to take that conversation offline and, um, and produce specific testing documents and produce specific uh, regulatory documents for um, a serious inquiry. So, um, but, you know, I, I am not going to pretend that I am a regulatory uh, lawyer. So I'm, I would rather take that conversation offline and, and offer uh, industry-specific answers um, just for the sake of um, the entire panel listening in today. Okay. Um, will the winch allow the user to auger into an overhead obstruction if the user keeps their finger off the throttle or on the throttle? I uh, well, so that's that's what I addressed earlier. Um, you can, uh, and actually, there's two there's two safety features. One is more accidental than anything, but the um, the vertical stem tube or the frontal tube or frontal stem. Um, is at a height where if you were to keep your fingers on the throttle at full throttle and you were sitting on the seat, uh, there's only about 28 or 26 inches of compression um, there and most, most body types and most anybody would be able to um, kind of crouch their body to be within the height of that frontal stem. Um, and like I said before, that's, it doesn't necessarily have a stall load when you uh, were to try to um, accelerate the tool into um, an immovable object, uh, but what will happen is the um, once the winch hits a load that it, it's no longer comfortable with moving, um, in the case of going up against an immovable object, the, the hard coat anodized aluminum drum will just spin within the wraps of the rope, um, kind of indicating that hey, you've gone too far here. Um, so it does, not, it, it does not have the capability of crushing someone um, between it and an immovable object. Um, and that's, that's actually one of the, the first things that uh, we tested at VRS was to you know, slam it into the ceiling and see what happens. And it was, we, it was proven. All right, and it looks like last question. Um, what types of features does it have to allow for shipping purposes and avoid the need for hazardous, hazardous materials protocols? I'm, I'm sorry, Jessica, can you say that one more time? Yeah, what types of features does it have to allow for shipping purposes and avoid the need for hazardous materials protocols? Uh, we've, you know, we have not run into any issues with shipping as long as it has an empty um, as long as it is completely empty of um, gasoline fluids, uh, we it, it comes in a um, in a fully enclosed crate, uh, a wheeled um, plastic crate box, much like a um, like a derivative of a Pelican type case, um, which is lockable and can ship in its own carrying case. Um, a, you know, the only thing that we've ever run into is is trying to check it as baggage, <laughs> um, which the TSA does not allow. Um, so we, I have never had any personal experience with having any trouble shipping the power seat. Um, I'm not going to say that somebody, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that that potential does not exist. Anytime you're doing anything with um, enclosed petrochemicals um, via shipping, you you may very well have to uh, go through a um, a different set of standards uh, depending on who you're shipping with and um, and what their protocol is for their shipping regulations. All right, and that looks like it's all the questions. So if anybody else has any quick questions, you can type them in while I'm finishing up. Um, otherwise, you can email Sean at the email shown on the screen. And um, anybody who wanted...
further clarification of their questions or to go into more detail, welcome to email him directly. And um, the PMI webinar series, we host webinars frequently, so you can keep an eye on our website to see future uh, topics and dates for webinars. Uh, for news and updates from PMI and from Harkin, you can sign up for the various social medias or email uh, options available at, shown at the bottom of your screen there. And we don't have any further questions, so um, we will say that that's the end of it. And if you have any further ones, go ahead and email Sean with them. Otherwise, we will uh, see you all at the next webinar. Thanks for everybody for attending, and thanks, Sean, for presenting this. Thanks for having me, Jessica. Have a great day, everybody.